43 of App Percussion. Today is Sunday, July 19th, and with me, as usual, are Ksenia Komjanovic. Hey, Carly. Hey, Ksenia. Ben Charles. Hi, Carly. And, of course, Casey Cangelosi is here, too. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Good, good. We're, we're kind of right here in the middle of the dog days of this weird coronavirus summer. How's everybody holding up? It's fine. Yeah. 12 month summer that's been going on in Texas and in Corona and everywhere. We haven't seen our students in so long. Yep, it's, going crazy. It's a, it's a weird one. Yep. Um, well, Casey, what happened? What happened today in history? Uh, sure, just a quickie. So today on release day in 1976, we had the first performance of Duke Ellington's ballet called Three Black Kings. And it's an Alvin Ailey dance theater production and choreography. And I guess the band leader was Duke Ellington's son, Mercer Ellington. And we've talked about a few other of these bigger orchestral works of Duke Ellington's. The only one we've really talked about to any substance is Black, Brown, and Beige. But we've also mentioned Harlem and Night Creature. I think they came up along in that same discussion. But Three Black Kings sounds like it's actually my favorite one of what I've heard so far. Not that I've listened to all these works extensively, but uh, a lot of cool percussion writing, a lot of like doubling marimba and piano, and uh, a lot of, yeah, a lot of uh, more adventurous percussion writing than I, I, I might have expected from, from what I, I thought I knew of Duke Ellington. But uh, the three black kings that he's talking about and the movements are represented by each one, but he, like his other pieces, he dives back into trying to tie the past into the present and saying something about how the perspective of race and culture has changed from before and to now. And anyway, the three black kings are uh, Balthazar, right? The black king of the Magi, King Solomon, and then Dr. King, Martin Luther King. So uh, yeah, that was 1976. And oh, one other fun little fact. I said that Mercer Ellington, his son, put it together. Apparently Duke Ellington had uh, kind of a superstition. We were talking about performance superstitions, like little rituals a few episodes ago. And I guess he had one about composition, which was he never wanted to write the last notes of a piece until the final, the, the first performance, like until like the, you know, the day of the premiere. He didn't do that with all of his works, but he did it with some of these bigger ones. So that was one of his little superstitions. And uh, unfortunately he passed away at its, uh, before its premiere. Uh, so his son got to like kind of piece together the final the final notes of it and and still like kind of hold that tradition. So yeah, that was 1976 and happened on release date. So now you're smarter. Oh, thanks. I needed that today. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. I I want to go listen to that. I I can't believe I haven't heard of it, but it sounds really cool. I'm really curious. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't think these pieces get played a lot. I mean, I don't think they get played uh, a, whole, a whole lot. I mean, they probably get played a lot, uh, relatively speaking, but um, yeah, probably not as much as they should, you know? It, it's cool when you hear about these obscure works. There's another one that, that I want to hear is Scott Joplin wrote an opera, and I think it was like kind of poorly reviewed in its day. I, don't, I, I think it's been maybe performed since then, but yeah, like huh. Scott Joplin wrote an opera. Who knew? It'd be cool to hear. <laughs> <laughs> is, that the one, is that the one with the Pippin xylophone excerpt that we have to learn all the time, or is that something else? No, that's a, that's a Gershwin you're thinking of. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Beth. Oh, right. And now you're smarter. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I do this. Thanks, one Ben. One step closer to a DMA, Cangelosi. <laughs> right. Uh, and Beth. All right. Got it. Well, here's what I'm wondering. Is anybody going to start a new performance tradition of don't learn the last couple of notes until the day of? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe that'll... <laughs> that sounds scary like about the challenge. composition. You could, just, you could just cross some T's and dot some I's in composition. That's harder to do in performance. <laughs> okay, I, this makes me want to ask a question, and I'm going to pick Ksenia at random. Ksenia, what is the what's the fastest you've ever learned and performed a major piece of music? Oh God, I'm really bad at this. I well, I am no longer I asked ashamed. Ksenia because I knew of everyone she would hate that question the most, actually. Yes, because <laughs> <laughs> she already said she's having a bad day, and so you asked her. Yes, yeah. please make my day worse. Um, I am just like Steve Schick. I take my time. Um, no, actually, I don't have any of those. Like, oh, Svet gave me, or whoever my your professor be gave me, you know, Merlin to learn in two weeks. I lied. 
I learned Omar's first movement um, in, um, learned, uh, let's take that with a grain of salt, in 72 hours because I had notice. That's how much notice I had. Is it that, was, is wow. That Gershwin? That's Gershwin. <laughs> That's Joplin. Joplin Gershwin. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The vibe solo, I know that. The beautiful vibe solo. It is, I, yeah. it is interesting when you when you find out like, oh, I need to perform this piece in a week. Uh, well, let's get to work. And you realize how fast you can do it like that. <laughs> yeah, but that felt like but it's not fun. overeating, yeah. not fun, <laughs> not a great performance, just survival mode. I mean, I'm sure it was a valuable skill, but I don't do that to myself in general. Yeah, I don't have those good stories. Sleep is important. So I remember yeah. that. <laughs> Well, without, without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce our guest today. Alana Wiesing is the principal timpanist of the Tucson Symphony Orchestra. She's an adjunct professor of percussion at the University of Arizona, Fred Fox School of Music. She holds both bachelor's and master's degrees from Indiana University and previously served as the principal timpanist of the Columbus, Indiana Philharmonic um, and Terre Haute Symphony Orchestra and was a regular substitute and extra percussionist with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra and Fort Wayne Philharmonic. Uh, recently, Alana was featured as a panelist on the Percussive Arts Society Virtual Roundtable on Breaking Racial Barriers in the Education and Performance World, which was really wonderful. Um, by the way, for anybody that didn't check it out earlier this month, um, you should definitely check it out. Um, Alana, welcome to the show. It's so wonderful to see you and have you on. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to be your guest today. This is awesome. I'm really looking forward to speaking with all of you. So because I haven't heard too much about um, about your job in Tucson, I do want to ask you about that, about playing with the orchestra. Before you won the job, you had been freelancing, playing in Indianapolis and Fort Wayne, Columbus, Indiana. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what are some differences musically between the freelancing, freelancing you were doing before and now that you're playing in a full-time professional orchestra? Uh, there are quite a few differences. Um, being a freelancer means that you're usually spending a lot of time on the road. A lot of my friends tenderly refer to this as being a member of the Freeway Philharmonic because we end up in different cities pretty much every weekend. And that actually is a part of freelancing that I really miss. I do miss traveling. I do miss working with different colleagues and friends, um, but it does put a decent amount of wear and tear on my car, gas money, additional expenses. Sometimes you have to put yourself up if you don't have friends or connections in the cities you're playing in, food, all sorts of other expenses that you incur by being a freelancer. Uh, but I do miss having that different work environment and working with different people all the time. Um, but now that I have my job with the TSO, I know my entire season schedule in advance. Uh, the orchestra sounds fantastic. I'm really enjoying it. I'm originally from Phoenix, which is just about an hour and 45 minutes, two hours north of here. Uh, so the atmosphere here is very familiar. Um, and I really do enjoy and have come to learn to enjoy that element of consistency and predictability in my schedule. Uh, being a freelancer means that you're playing different instruments, different setups, different pieces every week, which is the same in a consistent job as well. Um, but you also in freelancing might not know about a gig until the day of. Um, it ranges any time from I would be contacted maybe two or three months out to play with a group to receiving phone calls on the morning of a concert and someone in the orchestra has an emergency or gets sick, whatnot, and I've been called to go up to play an indie saying, hey, can you play this coffee series concert? We need you to play cymbals on DeRozan Cavalier. And I just drove up, got ready. Thankfully, I had played the piece in that specific part before and came in and it went really well. Um, but I think it's really important as a freelancer to be prepared for a very diverse set of circumstances and be prepared to play a wide range of instruments and be in be prepared for a lot of different situations being in the tso being the principal timpanist i know i'm going to come in and just play timpani all the time i don't have any other um obligations or worries in terms of instrumentation unless i am working with 
uh, the TSO percussion quartet. And that's a really nice sort of break from just playing timpani all the time. But those gigs are few and far between sort of scattered intermittently throughout the season. But I'd say the biggest difference is not having to travel as much, um, having my job now in the TSO, knowing my schedule ahead of time and just focusing on being a timpanist for the most part. Um, that's awesome. I think Ben should have directed that uh, evil question to you then, since you got calls, you know, in the mornings for the night up. But what is the scariest fast learning musical situation that you had to go through? Oh, gosh. Um, I would say another similar experience that I had with the Indianapolis Symphony. It was another call that I had gotten that morning to sight read. Thankfully, it was just a rehearsal. It wasn't for a concert. Um, but the entire program featured pieces that I had never performed or heard before. And so I'm literally on my drive up from Bloomington to Indianapolis, which is about an hour long drive, and just listening to these pieces over and over and over again. Uh, to make sure that I could be as prepared as possible. And obviously I couldn't get on instruments beforehand. And so essentially my experience with learning those parts was having some time on stage about a half hour to 40 minutes before rehearsal started to iron out any notes that I needed to learn and ask any additional questions about the timing or how these parts fit in better in context with how the section wanted to have them played. So that was that was definitely pretty terrifying and had me on edge. But again, thankful that it went really well and the guys were were super supportive and helpful. That's awesome. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna add to that. I mean like I you know through that question on Ksenia, learning like a solo piece in a short amount of time you know, like there's always the discrepancies between performance practice and score. But I mean if you had the score for reflections on the nature of water, you could pretty much hack out a performance of it somewhat accurately. I like the, the pressure of having to listen to uh, recordings like on the fly seems just so, so difficult to me. Kandelosi like, disagrees. No, uh, I'm mirroring Kandelosi. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm not saying, it's, I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm just saying that, you know, like you're not going to make a fool out of yourself in rehearsal with other people is all I'm saying. Oh, <laughs> if you think you, you, the boat, you're, you're alone on the boat. It's fine. <laughs> it's no I'm problem. Like talking and everyone's laughing. No, no, no. I'm not saying that's a good idea. I'm not saying, you know, do that. I'm just saying I would rather be in the situation of having to learn a solo piece been like, hey, Rosen Cavaliers tonight, no rehearsal, can you show up? That's all I'm saying. You know, you know how that would go for me then? Like the second movement, it would go, <laughs> yeah, whenever I get lost, whenever I have memory slip, just straight to yellow after the rain until I find it. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's <laughs> Well, the, well, do, you, do you think this free, like this, how long was this freelancing period in your career? Um, there was some overlap with uh, the end of my undergrad and through my master's. So, uh, so, yeah, so in total, I freelanced for about five or six years. But uh, once I graduated with my master's in 2016, I exclusively was able to focus on freelance without having to have any uh, school obligations for about three years. It's funny yeah. how we we often, I mean, we bump into a lot of people. I know I do this too. But like we talk about that grind that you did before your real job, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and even percussion ensembles, they have to go through percussion quartets or, or, you know, so percussion, third percussion, there's like a period where they have to stay persistent, you know, and like, like kind of stay the course and like keep going and keep eating rice and beans, you know, don't, you know, like how long can you, can you sustain that? And I find we're often talking about that period of our, uh, of our life. What did I say? I said third percussion, third coast percussion. That's a yeah, thing. It's like, I was gonna, it's like a med school residency. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Miserable. But then you're, once you're out of it, you're out of it. Yeah. So then you, you make the big bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting because 
even throughout that time that I was a freelancer, I was still actively taking auditions as well. And so I had to make sure that I was carving out time in addition to freelancing, in addition to holding down another smaller part-time job that I was working and preparing for auditions and just making sure that there was no element of my preparation or performance that was being sacrificed through any of that. Um, and there were definitely some difficult decisions that I had to make um, over the last three years in regards to which auditions that I could take, whether it was purely schedule related reasons, sometimes financial reasons. Um, and so it was definitely a, a balancing act. And uh, I definitely commend any musician out there who's in that grind and, and hustling in that way, because I feel like uh, those musicians don't get enough recognition or enough consideration. And it's just as legitimate and fulfilling a career to have that line of work um, than it is to have a you know full-time position somewhere. So I definitely look back on that period of time with, with great fondness. And I did learn a lot about being a better, more considerate, compassionate uh, musician and how to better work with colleagues and adapting to different situations. Um, and those experiences really did help to shape my musicianship and help prepare me uh, for my job with the Tucson Symphony because I felt that my transition was actually very smooth into this job because of that. Oh, very cool. Is it fair to say that, and I know we've talked about this on the show, the sort of ringing a bell, but people who freelance and it's it's this crazy grind and it's all over the place and it's borrowing gear and it's making contracts for cartage and like nothing's consistent, nothing's ever the same. The goal is to eventually have some kind of consistency and say like, oh yeah, I can always count on these Christmas gigs come the holiday season. And I, I'm, I'm always the second call for Boston Baroque and I'm always um, on the sub list for this. And like eventually it does turn into this somewhat reasonably or very reasonable, like steady kind of career where, yep, I've got all my gigs and the, these are the groups of folks that call me. And I just think it's important to add that for, for anyone listening who thinks like, oh God, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dive into that. That sounds impossible, you know? No, I absolutely. I think for me, there was a part of me that could count on that consistency to a certain degree. And there was another part of me that always kept the thought in the back of my mind, like there might be a time where I shouldn't be so complacent and just be counting on that phone to ring or for those emails to come in and always be working extra hard to make sure that when full-time auditions did come up that I could be as completely prepared as possible. Um, but yeah, I do think that having that balance of making sure that you're well-connected and well-prepared enough so that when those opportunities do arise, you can consistently perform at the best level you can while also keeping that hunger and that drive in the back of your mind and not feeling so settled about uh, counting on those opportunities. Because for me, even though I was really grateful to have, especially towards the last year or two of my time freelancing, some very consistent work, um, I made sure that I never felt comfortable. I was always working hard and making sure that I could continue to advance my career. Cool. Freelancing can feel like, I think, a combination, especially if you're applying for jobs or you're taking auditions, a combination of the, the short game, which is like be prepared week to week, everything, manage everything you have on your plate, and then also long game what am I doing to improve my situation? Although, Casey, like you said, freelancing is a 100% feasible, sustainable um, life as a musician, depending on where you live and what kind of opportunities there are. Um, if you yeah. if you stick with it till it gets to that point, right? Yeah. 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 Until until coronavirus, um, but that's a that's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah. Alana, I wanted to ask: Was there anything? on the job in Tucson that you felt your schooling and your audition preparation and your freelance orchestral experience didn't prepare you for? Were there any surprises, good or bad or anything in between? Honestly, I can, I, I'm thankful to be able to 
answer this question with a no. I, I went into that job feeling generally that my transition was very smooth because uh, through various freelancing experiences, through having the honor and privilege to be able to get scholarships to attend various summer music festivals, uh, having a wide variety of performance experience in orchestra um, before arriving here was really, really helpful for me. But what I will say is that uh, the greatest learning curve was definitely the very first day on the job. Um, it was Beethoven 7 on the program, which is one of my all-time favorite pieces to perform. And I went in, I was super prepared. I had played the piece before, but had brought in, you know, my weeks of preparation, score study, mallet selection, all the rest of it. And went into that first rehearsal having a very clear vision of this is how I think the piece should be played. And it just turned out that our music director wanted a different sound concept for the piece and wanted me to just generally use more articulate sticks. And we had another rehearsal immediately the next morning. So I had less than an 11 or 12 hour turnaround time to just completely go back to the drawing board, figure out exactly how to fulfill the music director's vision while also staying true to my artistic integrity. But the main priority of course was just making sure that the music director was happy with what I was doing and I was doing what he wanted me to do. And so I came back to rehearsal the next morning and he seemed very pleased with the adjustments that I'd made. And then any other comments through the rest of the week were purely phrasing or musical related comments. And I took those notes to heart we played a bunch of Beethoven this season, like so many other orchestras around the country have. Um, and so I just internalized that sound concept, carried that through with the rest of the season before we got shut down. Um, we still ended up playing the first eight of the nine Beethoven symphonies over the course of this season. And depending on how the virus will impact the fall for us, um, we are scheduled to play the Ninth Symphony in November or December of this year. Um, so just internalizing that sound concept and just making sure that I carried that through and that he could clearly see that I had paid attention um, to the notes that he had given me. Um, but yeah, that was that was honestly the the most difficult part for me was that learning curve and also the learning curve of adjusting to our different halls that we play in. Um, because those three halls sort of exist on every part of the sound spectrum. One of our halls is sort of right in the middle between being really dry and really live um, and being just completely dead. Um, and then one of our run out spaces, you make the sound and it just immediately dissipates. You just can't hear it. There's no resonance whatsoever. Um, and then our third performance space is one of the most live spaces that I've ever played in. And so being able to adjust to all of those different spaces and um, those configurations was also a huge learning curve. But thankfully from a, a musical perspective, I, I'm really thankful to say that my transition to my job has been very smooth so far. I've heard of that old timpani saying, you have two sets of mallets, harder, hard and harder. <laughs> you know, that's, I don't know who, I don't know who said that, but it's the, I heard that story, like, you know, the maestro asks you for something different, you were using these, you go, oh yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely, I, I can do that for you. <laughs> and then then you play and they're like yeah it was great yeah brilliant yeah that that's a that's a classic maneuver um and another thing too is i've i've found in my experience here too that if you choose a mallet that is just slightly harder than what you would think you would need to use um, and if it makes you just a little uncomfortable the way it sounds on top of the instrument, it's likely going to sound great by the time the sound sort of is able to congeal out in the hall. Um, so I, I'm still a little bit trying to live with that uncomfortable feeling. Um, and also in terms of 
the timing um, being so far back and just having that complete will and conviction on all of your entrances and how you stylistically can shape the orchestra and shape its timing. Um, that's something that I've continued to make a priority and continue to work on and listen back to recordings and stuff as well. Um, so that's something that's, you know, unique for, for me in any situation that I'm in. But yeah, I found that if it makes you just a teeny bit uncomfortable with the articulation, it's, it's usually right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the value of participating in uh, music festivals for your career, and I looked at your bio, and you were busy from 2007 to 2019 between, what was it, uh, Eastern Music Festival, right? And yep. then to, to Aspen all the way, except that I noticed there was one year, if I'm not mistaken, that you did not go. Um, was it a personal decision? What happened? What did you do with that one summer of your adult life that you didn't go and play music? Yeah, so that was the summer of 2014, which was the year between my undergrad and my master's. And so for me, I thought it was really important at that juncture to take a little bit of a breather uh, between degrees. Um, I moved into a new place, even though I was staying in the same city. Um, and just have some, some me time and just to reset and reflect about how the last four years went, the direction that I wanted the next two years to go, um, and just take care of myself a little bit more in addition to, of course, my, my musical goals. But um, I just felt it was best to have that time for myself. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. All from 2007 till last year, I had basically attended a festival every single summer. Um, and I'm really, really grateful that I was able to get scholarships to be able to afford and have those opportunities. Um, and I think it's incredibly invaluable the experience that you get attending these festivals on so many different levels um you get the experience working with a lot of different teachers um which getting those different perspectives at various points in my training was really neat um really importantly too you meet friends and colleagues people who you're going to cross paths with theoretically through the rest of your career and also friends for life, you know, just on a personal level, people that you stay connected to. And for me, especially that first summer that I went to Eastern Music Festival, that was my first experience sort of getting a taste of what a day in the life of a professional musician really looked like, you know, having those daily rehearsals, attending master classes, attending professional concerts and the concerts of your friends and colleagues. Um, and having a taste of that schedule really opened my eyes to the fact that this could be a possible career. And it was something that I really enjoyed. And I'm still friends with so many people that I have met over the course of all of these festivals that I've attended. And they're all people who are already in the field who won jobs before me, who also have jobs and are coming up and they're about to win jobs, you know? Um, and so I think it's really important, of course, within our own field, you know, making those connections in percussion specifically as well, but having those connections with people who play all different instruments um, and across all different genres too, I think is, is so invaluable. And so, I cannot stress enough the importance of trying to attend a festival or an institute, some sort of summer program to keep yourself engaged in the process because sometimes I would feel like I would make more progress artistically over the summer than I would during the school year. Not to say that I still didn't make important good strides, but I think having that exposure to different perspectives, having a different set of ears on your playing, um, having different friends and colleagues to inspire you and you can play from each other and learn from each other, um, I think was, was so critical to my development as a musician. And I can't recommend them highly enough. There's the whole 
yeah. part of getting the rep in line too, right? Like I know Dave Herbert was on this podcast and he said <laughs> about the Rite of Spring, I believe. He said, <laughs> you know, the first time you play the Rite of Spring is not when you should, when you're recording it with the San Francisco Symphony. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what I mean? And like yeah. so he said, that's what's also what's so great about these festivals like it's so important like you need a test run on some of the hard rep and and a lot of people when they're scouting these summer festivals they're like oh they're doing right of spring i gotta i gotta be there or they're doing they're doing mall or two i gotta be there something like that absolutely yeah i think that that was really helpful for me coming into this job too because a vast majority of this tso season um, was full of pieces that i have already played before which was really neat and really helpful in my preparation because I already had that level of familiarity and then just revisiting those pieces with a more fresh perspective uh, was a really great experience. And yeah, you're right on the money. Having all of that repertoire under my belt entering this job has been so helpful. Well, Alana, I had a, a question on uh, going back to the freelance topic for a minute. I was looking up, it was episode 55 with Jeff Irving. Uh, we talked way back when about freelancing nightmare stories and Casey had a story about forgetting his underwear. I had a story about forgetting my pants and no, Jeff had this, this what? great, you did, you told that story on the podcast. You can look it, it up. Like, what? It was like I was traveling and I yeah, yeah, you know, I guess not, that wasn't freelancing, but uh, Jeff had this great story about, I think he had a gig in upstate New York and like he got up there uh, and it was like snowy and he he realized he forgot his timpani mallets and uh the only oh, yeah. place that was open that like seemed like they might have something was a pet store <laughs> and he said uh he got these two uh they were like perches for er, for birds they were these like thick wooden sticks that, that he got and i think played uh Haydn or something with he was like thank god it wasn't like Mahler. uh but anyway <laughs> i was wondering did you have any, uh, have you ever had any freelancing nightmare stories where either some sort of situations come up or you, you've you forgotten something or, or anything like that? Man, honestly, offhand, I can't think of anything, but I think that's just because I'm such, I have such a perfectionist personality and I'm, I'm so detail oriented and, and really strict about, you know, making sure that I pack everything that I need the night before setting it at a specific place by the door, checking it two, three, four times to make sure that I have absolutely everything that I need. Um, and so offhand, I can't, I can't remember any sort of horror stories or forgetting gear or anything like that, which is super helpful. Um, I'm really glad that I, I didn't find myself in those positions. Although I have certainly found myself uh, having some car troubles to and from gigs. That's been terrifying. And I'm really grateful that in those situations, I was either able to get to the gig on time. I literally remember my car breaking down on the way up to an Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra gig. And I had left well in advance as well. Like I had left at least two hours early, you know, thinking, okay, it's gonna take me an hour to get up there. I get there an hour early. I have some time to change into concert clothes, warm up, relax, and be totally ready to walk on stage and not feel anything. But my car broke down, then also hit a patch of traffic because there was always been endless construction on 37 ever since I lived there. And I'm pretty sure there's still construction on it now. Um, and so I was really panicking and I get to the parking garage about 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes before the concert's supposed to start. I can't find a spot last second, make a spot for myself in the parking garage and literally just sprint out and into the hall. And I'm really grateful I was already wearing my concert attire so I didn't have to spend an extra couple minutes to get changed. So I'm literally a little bit of sweat on me as I walk on stage with literally four or five minutes to spare before the concert is supposed to start. Um, and it's really crazy because I had 
felt that I had done anything in my power to ensure that I would have plenty of time. And so I'm really grateful that I left early and um, I'm glad, I mean, the concert and everything went really well, but that's, that's the closest that I have felt to literal panic and terror in one of those situations ever. Yeah, I will say one one thing you sort of uh, danced around here is like sometimes something might come up to where you're you might actually be losing money on a gig, mm. but long term it might make sense to lose money on that gig to take that Uber to get there in time, just to keep the gig. I mean, if you were playing with Indianapolis Symphony, that's not one that you would want to uh, to give up just because you missed one rehearsal. Yeah, absolutely like not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, since in our little text chat, Carly and I had a little thing going here, I, I thought I'd share with everyone that. There was one time where Carly and I had a gig in Miami, and I was bringing a gong down from Boca Raton, and I packed the gong stand and promptly left. And as we were unpacking, I realized I didn't have the gong, and we were both freaking out. And I felt so bad because Carly was the only one that had to play it, and Carly had brought me timpani <laughs> to play. Uh, so that was not very cool of me. Luckily, the rehearsal was such a giant train wreck that we didn't actually even get to the part where Carly needed to play the gong in the rehearsal. And Svet was kind of loaning us one from Miami. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it, it all worked out okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But Carly, I, I apologize yet again. <laughs> You're still making up for that. <laughs> oh, man. Well, the moral of the story is checklists, right? I'm always making like two different lists all the mallet sticks, beaters, whatever that I need, all the instruments, hardware, everything, um, and leave plenty of time because. You never know. You never yeah, know. I tried to do that with every single gig that I ever played. Yeah. Well, Alana, you've been you've been speaking so powerfully and so eloquently on the topic of race and discrimination in the percussion world in recent months with everything that's going on in, in our country and around the world. Um, you were a featured panelist, like I mentioned, on the PAS roundtable discussion. Um, you were a guest on Jeremy Epps Friday, Timpani Hang back in June too, and talked quite a bit about that. And you posted a really powerful video on your own Facebook wall earlier in the summer that is just, anybody that hasn't listened to, to these things should definitely check them out. Alana's been doing a lot of, a lot of good work and, and saying a lot of important things that need to be said. Um, I wonder, Alana, do you feel a kind of responsibility as a black female principal timpanist to tell your story and to maintain a certain degree of visibility in the orchestral world? Yeah, I think it's incredibly important for me and um, having this position now with the Tucson Symphony and now teaching at University of Arizona, um, I feel that it's very important to set that level of visibility as a precedent um, and also important to just give voice to these really important issues. Obviously, they impact me on a personal level, um, but even if they didn't impact me on a personal level, I feel like I would still be speaking out about these issues because these are things that um, have been impacting percussion specifically, as well as the world at large for quite a while. Um, and I'm very, thankful and honored and humbled to have a platform that allows me the confidence to speak up about these issues and use my experiences as a vessel to sort of give voice to these issues. Um, so yeah, the, the video that you alluded to, um, that video was made not too long after the George Floyd incident and that was sort of a tipping point for racial tensions and divisiveness in this country. Um, and I think it was really a combination of a lot of different factors. The incident itself um, is highly disturbing and uh, that video leaves really no room whatsoever for any uh, other interpretation other than deliberate uh, hate-based violence. Um, so seeing that incident, um, in addition to others leading up to that point in growing numbers, um, certainly those incidences have been happening for a very long time. Um, but I think they were given more of a platform given the fact that we are in this pandemic atmosphere right now, more people are paying attention to the news. 
Um, and so I think it was just this perfect storm of people are cooped up. They're paying attention. They see this footage that is so powerful and terrible and it incites that level of anger and rage and frustration that is so completely valid. And so then we start to see these protests in the street. Um, and that's a result of obviously these incidences and then people, I think, just feeling stir crazy in general, wanting to get out and also make a difference with these causes, which is fantastic. Um, but what's devastating also about these protests is that um, the pandemic is disproportionately affecting African-American people. And so it's completely understandable for us to be out in the street and giving voice and uh, supporting these causes. But from this pandemic perspective, it's also life threatening. And so it's a real catch 22 situation um, and difficult to really see all of this happening. And so my video was created as a response to that event more specifically, as well as understanding the responsibility that I feel that I have and my unique position of being the only female African-American principal timpanist in the country, that there is that level of visibility uh, that I have um, and I am the only member uh, of the community at the professional level who has that intersection of those affected minority groups, especially as they pertain to percussion more specifically. Um, so it was very important for me to respond. And I wanted to make sure that I did so in a way that was very calm, collected, articulate, yet still just as impassioned. Um, but I definitely also wanted to make sure that I was not responding from a place of that anger, frustration, and rage. Certainly, I do still feel those things very viscerally, but I didn't want that raw emotion to cloud the effectiveness of the message that I've been trying to spread and the awareness that I'm trying to promote of greater diversity, of greater inclusion, of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that it was done in a way that could accomplish all of those things as effectively as possible. Um, and again, I'm incredibly grateful that, you know, I'm specifically receiving this attention and having these appearances to be able to speak with all of you and others about these issues. I'm incredibly honored and humbled um, but for me, the most important thing is really giving voice to these issues and using my experience and my platform as a vessel to help advance them for the greater good. Well, one thing, one thing that I, I think we all agree on is that we don't want to have all these conversations and say, this is important. This is, you know, we want to fight for better representation and equality and equal opportunity and everything. And then, you know, we kind of just move on and nothing, nothing changes, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. um, Alana, I wonder, what do you think is our responsibility both as musicians and as educators to improve the representation in our field in percussion? Uh, well, first of all, I want to touch on something that, that you said earlier in the question. I think it does need to be a consistent ongoing conversation. I am um, my fear always with any of these incidents that occur, whether it's in our field or in the world at large, um, that they're sort of this blip on the radar, that they're discussed for a very short period of time. Um, they get that widespread attention and discussion, and then they are swept back under the rug and never fully addressed um, and never continuously engaged. And so I think it's a huge priority for us at this juncture and moving forward to continuously be having these conversations and making those efforts. Now, as to how to best make those efforts, um, I am a huge proponent of early education. And I think that while a significant amount of work still needs to be done at the professional level and at the collegiate level, 
um, at addressing these um, issues of diversity and inclusion. I really believe that early education holds a lot of our answers because these problems at their core are systemic, they're institutional, and they're financial. And the really sad, disappointing reality of this situation is that a lot of these underrepresented minority groups don't have that level of support, especially at younger ages, or they don't have that level of accessibility um, or those opportunities to know that this can be a viable, possible, sustainable career for them. And so by the time you come around to that junior, senior year of high school where you're starting to decide for yourself, okay, what schools do I want to apply to? What do I want my major to be? What direction do I think I want to try and take my career and the rest of my life? Those options, unfortunately, for a career in classical music, unfortunately, aren't really on the table for a lot of these groups simply because I think for the most part, they lack that awareness or um, the accessibility to those opportunities. Um, and so by the time it gets to that point, they're already way further behind than they could be or should be. Um, because obviously when you are preparing an audition for these programs, you're expected to be at a certain level of proficiency and competency across, you know, the big three, you know, across snare drum, marimba slash mallets and timpani. Um, and so if they don't have regular access to private lessons, if they don't have even access to a solid enough public school education and music program um, or other programs in their communities, which they can be fostering and developing these skills, then it's going to become increasingly more difficult as time goes on and as they find themselves in the collegiate level and at a place where they're starting to take auditions for bigger jobs. Um, and so, yes, I do think that there needs to be that level of acknowledgement at the professional level um, and auditioning for sure, um, as well as the collegiate level to have those, that's those systems in, of support in place. Um, but so far during my time here in Tucson, I've really, tried my best to start to plant roots of that level of community engagement and interacting with and teaching kids at much younger ages. And even if it's not percussion specifically, um, at least getting them interested in the music making and creation process, giving them that greater accessibility to come listen to the Tucson Symphony, to for me, well, for me to give back in a way, sometimes it might mean me donating my time. Sometimes that might mean that I don't charge as much or if anything at all for private lessons for these underserved groups. Because for me, I view it as paying it forward, giving them opportunities that they wouldn't have had or wouldn't have known about otherwise. And so I really do think that early education and targeting children of younger ages can really help address this problem. And it doesn't just improve accessibility and opportunity for those underserved groups, which is obviously of the greatest benefit in this situation, but I think it helps everyone. And the theory behind it is that it trickles up into the high school level, into the collegiate level, and theoretically into the professional level as time goes on. And so I really do believe in the power of early education and think that needs to be more of a priority, especially in tackling these issues of diversity and inclusion moving forward. Yeah, for sure. That's where that's where the seed is planted for anything to, to grow and to happen from there. Um, thanks so much for for well, for your answers here and for everything that you're doing to, to use your voice and your platform um, to share this with your experiences with us. Uh, well, Kenia, 
I think you have a topic for us today. Yeah, uh, it's a sort of, uh, I mean, it's definitely related to, to what you were talking about because um, we need to shift power structures, obviously. They get too hungry and then they get a little bit too big for us, so we got to crush them and change them. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is um, based on this article that came out in the Irish Times called If the Artist Offends, Should We Pluck Their Work? Um, and this is more about the idea of, of cancel culture, right? Uh, it's a more, more recent buzzword, but it's not like cancel culture is anything new. Um, people have been canceled since you know, the French Revolution was the cancellation of a bunch of bourgeoisie and uh, Alan Turing um, being convicted uh, for gross indecency, quote unquote, um, even after he had saved the world with, you know, cracking the enigma. That's also a case of, of cancellation in some way. Um, however, this uh, article sort of asks, uh, can we separate, you know, the writer from their work, the musician from their music, the painter from their visual art? And um, there were several groups of people that were named, um, sort of summarizing now um, in the article as examples. Um, a couple of them were the American author Richard Ford, um, who treated his critics really harshly. Um, he sent to one of them his a book with a bullet hole in it, and another one he spat on. Um, so obviously very bad behavior. I mean, if you don't like people, there's better ways to express that. Um, or if you disagree with them. Then there was uh, Peter Handke, um, the Nobel Prize uh, winning author uh, who was um, uh, very, um, well, he was, he, he got a lot of backlash for his comments on the war in Yugoslavia. And then uh, Ben's favorite, uh, personal favorite, uh, Roald Dahl. Am I pronouncing that name right for a Serbian? Yeah. The, <laughs> the British author, um, who we know for his work for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, who was a known anti-Semite, among other things. Um, and in case you guys didn't know that, you folks didn't know this, um, so the early drafts of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory had the Oompa Loompas as a tribe of African pygmies promoting the quote-unquote happy slave myth as they merrily toiled and rhymed in Willy Wonka's factory. It's funny, and they were like, paint them orange, that'll make it okay. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's it's incredible. Uh, his American yeah. editor had to tell him that the original description of the blood-bottling giant, a dark-skinned, flat-nosed creature with thick, rubbery lips, as they say, was a racist stereotype. He needed a cue, you know, for that. He, he wasn't, that didn't, you know, click. Um, so those are the kind of people that um, have, through their words, um, s sort of expressed some controversial, um, discriminatory, offensive opinions, right? But then there's another level. There's uh, the kind of people, like we can um, all remember Michael Jackson, Finding Neverland, um, and everything that was related to, to his life and then how his work um, suffered consequences through that. And then there's a, another example here, much less known, artist Eric Gill, whose sculptures still stand outside the BBC's broadcasting house in London and in Westminster Cathedral. And um, his typefaces he helped develop are used everywhere from classic penguin paperbacks to London underground signage. But anyway, his private acts were about as bad as one can imagine. As they say, not only did he sexually abuse uh, two of his da daughters, he even carried out what he considered sexual experiments on the family dog. Now, why is Angela an outcast? We all, all recognize, you know, Michael Jackson, but not him. It, is it because his daughters maintained that the abuse did not do them any harm? Quote, they said, we just took it for granted. This is what the article said. Um, They, they claim no, this is because Gill is not a public fig figure. Um, his areas of art are relatively obscure. Yes, it's there, but we don't know who the author is. So out of sight, out of mind. Um, so th the question then goes, um, sort of, does, does this even matter? And I would like to ask this question, I guess, to Ben first, because if we look at Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, if we don't know um, where the original idea came from, I guess, or how he wanted to express it in the first place. Uh, perhaps not even, you know, the most scrupulous of, of um, 
journalists would be able to find any connections to, say, racist or discriminatory thought. So does it matter? So should we tell people not to consume that type of art if the artist himself or herself is problematic? Yeah, it's it's an interesting discussion, and I think like the the highlight of this needs to be like we're talking about uh, innocuous works of art that are conceived by people that you know have these things about them, not blatantly racist pieces of work or something. Oh, and definitely. the name that always comes to mind for this for me is Mahler. Uh, not sorry, not Mahler. Um, <laughs> totally Wagner. <the> name. Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> they rock. Uh, it's fine. Not Mahler. <laughs> Uh, no, but Wagner was like a, in his day a known anti-Semite and I mean just just a horrible horrible person but wrote amazing music and like how do we you know reckon with this today and I think I think one of the most significant things we can think about is you know like is that person or that person's estate benefiting from you know their tendencies and I think in the case of Wagner probably not but Michael Jackson on the other hand might be a different case um, but it, it, this whole discussion, it brought my, to mind for me, uh, have you guys watched the most recent Aziz Ansari Netflix stand-up special? He talks like, pretty extensively yeah. about this as related to R. Kelly and Michael Jackson. Uh -huh. And I, I, I wanted to read, I'm just going to like, I hate to, to try and quote, like, and also Aziz Ansari is someone that could fall in this category for some sexual, some other sexual uh, yeah, abuse, allegations. Al yeah, accusations, allegations. Um, but I wanted to, to quote from him. Uh, he was talking about music and in particular Michael Jackson. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna quote him. So here we go. He says, how do you erase that stuff from your life? It becomes a part of you, right? You know what I always thought would be the craziest conundrum? What if in 1999, Osama bin Laden put out an incredible jazz album and people were like, this is a seminal work. This is Miles Coltrane and bin Laden, right? And that day you're watching the news and the anchors on there like, uh, it appears the perpetrator of the attacks was jazz legend Osama bin Laden. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and he goes on with this, but it really does make you think like, what if, you know, like, what if someone that made the greatest jazz record of all time just put put kind of blue to shame? Uh had also done something like that. Would, you know, would we still listen to the music? And it's like, it's just a weird discussion to to be you know thinking about um like i said i mean for me personally a lot of it comes down to you know if the work is innocuous itself is someone benefiting from someone else's oppression or was it just something nasty they said and it's i think one thing we're realizing now in today's culture is that you know all of our heroes were just human beings and we all have our shortcomings and our faults Thomas Jefferson, great American, great Virginian, very proud of that, but also did some very not so great things um, that are relevant to discuss today. And should we have a monument of Thomas Jefferson still? And I don't, I don't have an answer, but yeah, it's, it's a very interesting discussion. I think I find it to be particularly interesting, and thank you for, for saying that, Ben, that's, you're totally right. Um, I find it to be particularly interesting with people who are still in their moment of creation, you know, um, to talk about people who have long been, you know, in their grave, that's, that's one thing, that's a, that's a more of a sort of it's a more of a semantic discussion that's more of a even a hypothetical discussion because it doesn't affect any living Tom, Thomas Jefferson, right? But, but in the case of J.K. Rowling and what she said and the cancel culture, um, obviously understanding that they cannot arrest anyone for having offensive thoughts or, or saying them out loud, but that they can definitely publicly join and uh, call to limit this person's... Um, public platform, you know, yeah, and, and to call to limit their access to, to work. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I was just going to add, like, since you kind of touched on it, like, freedom of speech does not mean you can say whatever you want without consequence, right? Like, that just says the government can't, per you know, prosecute you for it. But, you know, if I come around and say some really nasty thing about Casey and people want to, you know, not buy my record anymore because of it, joke's on you, I don't have a record. <laughs> 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 Uh, you know, it's, 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 yeah, you cannot say anything you want without, without consequences. So yeah, sorry to, you know, what is that, uh, boycott by wallet or whatever, whatever that 
just, exactly you know, the, yeah, the yeah. whole thing of, of voting with your dollar but then i wonder you know th what is the point the point is to i guess punish for example let's take jk rowling by taking away her financial assets or you know lowering her financial standards and by taking away some of her prestige or you know whatever um just her status but I feel like that's a very, and pardon me again for, for saying this, but that's a very capitalist way of punishing someone. It's sort of like a cultural memento mori, you know, sort of like you are not arrested, you are not dead, but culturally you have been anesthetized or comatose. I, I really wonder if, you know, we, we focus on ways of punishment instead of ways of rehabilitation. I think especially in terms of artists, hopefully these are people who have shown that they've been a bit more open-minded than, than most. Um, perhaps those are the exact people that when we notice a, a symptom of discriminatory thought or offensive thought, we should embrace them and sort of bring them into the machine of, hey, let's, let's have you have conversations with these exact people that you have something against to see what you can learn, to see how you can become better and more empathetic. Um, I feel like the punishment culture, especially when it just punishes your wallet, I mean, that's, I feel like that, that it almost, it's like it prizes the human being solely based on the wallet. You, you are awarded through money, you are punished through money, and that's it. We don't care about your actual soul, your well-being, or whether this is going to heal. We're just going to punish you, sort of like the incarceration, cultural incarceration. System. And also, like, to go along with that, it, it doesn't allow someone an opportunity for growth. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, but please, other opinions. I'm really curious. I feel like it's, you know, we were talking about this just yesterday, actually, in the Beta Percussion Institute. The student said, this is such an issue right now. And we want to talk about this. And, and one of the questions was, what can we do about this? And I said, work on your platform. Like, if you have something to say, something you can really do to be helpful is to like be successful in your career and then you can uh, do things so you have a voice very much like Alana alluded to with uh, her timpani position you know I actually pulled the the students I said who's heard of my podcast and like you know 80 percent hands went up maybe 75 someone's like okay exactly like if you can say it to more people then you in fact have like a louder voice um, so like right now when you all are students that that's the most important thing because you need to take care of yourself anyway like it doesn't do any you can't really be an advocate for other causes if you're not taking care of yourself like you need to be on your feet in order to like have the facilities to go go out and do this but so i, I thought that was uh you know i'd like to say that again to, to all our young listeners because i think we primarily have have younger listeners but but also yeah just the, the basic question like should we should we boycott this stuff that um you know we find offensive or or someone like yeah the easy example is wagner i find it very easy to separate like wagner it's um it's it's very simple to me but but then again i went to music school so when you learned about beethoven you didn't also just learn oh he's amazing and he's perfect and glory to the white male because he's a white male it's like wait no he was like so miserable if you think Beethoven is an amazing human, you need, you need to read more about Beethoven. You know, so like the people who are saying like, oh, we absolutely have to, you know, like totally change our music curricula and everything. And it's like, I think it's great. Do some William Grant still. Do say, You can definitely have substitutes and there's, there's plenty of people out there to use instead of what, what else is out there. But like, if you think learning about Beethoven is like glorifying him as a person, well, you haven't read enough about Beethoven, you know? And uh, it's, so anyway, I think there's that. And you can say the same thing about Schumann and you can say the same thing about Brahms and you can say the same thing. <laughs> it's like, it's pretty, it, I, I mean, I think that is in fact why it's interesting. Like who is it, who, who is perfect? Like give me someone who's perfect. It's like, no, there are no perfect, no perfect anybody. But anyway, I, I think it's easy to separate Wagner especially because I, I, I really don't think anyone in history ever, I might be wrong about this, like went into a Wagner opera and like that just like amazing moment in Tristan and he's old or when the you know when the Montel Savant bells go off in in um in Parsifal they just went like oh that's so beautiful oh man maybe the Jews were really bad because that's so gorgeous like no it's separate I'm like what nobody nobody ever thought that you know like wow he's amazing maybe he's right about the Jews like what no like Whoever thought that? 
nobody like come on yeah so i don't know that's like very easy today i think to just go like dude those aren't they're not related they're just literally not really related it, however it's... however counter example james levine returns to the podium um, gosh that's what yeah. I'm so cool. about. Like, yeah like he just got like several hirings and little posts have occurred like i have no understanding for that i'm happy to boycott that because like we don't need him it's like dude wait there's so many good conductors just don't what well, we don't need him why you know like well, we, we can't have another ring cycle it's like that's the ring cycle period is done plus it's like in the past high bringing james levine back around students is like in fact dangerous it's like wait he's a known we know he is a, a, a sex offender in these very specific ways. That's been a known fact for so long. It's like everyone knows that. So, A, we don't need him. Just hire another conductor. He, who cares that it's him? And, B, don't put him in, front of, in a position of power in front of people again. So that one's a no-brainer. It's very easy to boycott. So I don't know. I feel like you have to it, – it's a very personal question. Like so-and-so – has made some comments, should you buy their music, should you endorse their mallets, or should you use their mallets, whatever. Yeah, you gotta just like go with how you feel about that. Like for some people it'd be more icky than others. And also like not everyone knows all the facts in a lot of these cases. Like some people's extent to what they know about James Levine is very minuscule <laughs> and they're maybe skeptical about it. And they're like, well, are you really sure? So like they might feel good about it. But if you really know, then I think they're probably not gonna, not gonna uh, buy that ticket. Yeah, I'll go ahead and chime in here too. I think yeah. I think it is really important to be taking all of these instances on a case by case basis and really challenge ourselves to have more nuanced discussions and more nuanced ass assessments of each of these individuals as people as well as their art and the art's impact. I mean, a a more mainstream example that I like to reference for myself is John Mayer because I absolutely love John Mayer's music, but it's so widely documented across the course of his career that he's been a womanizer, that he has ego problems, is very self-serving, other you know negative, terrible attributes. Um, and so for me, I, I definitely agree with Casey. I think it is possible to separate the art from the artist in certain circumstances and in other circumstances their art is a direct reflection of who they are at the core as people and i think it's really important to sort of take on a case-by-case -case basis how much of that relationship is at play in any given situation and i think it's important to also ask ourselves the question well if we're going to quote cancel these people and if these people have said and done these terrible things does that then invalidate my memories and my engagement with their art you know does that take anything away from how i received their creation or their art because for me i think putting myself back into the audience's position I think it's really important to acknowledge that responding to art and having that level of engagement with art and how it may impact us on a wide variety of levels is incredibly valid. And I don't think that that person's actions um, have any impact or bearing on my experience with that piece of art specifically. Um, more often than not, maybe it does if it's, you know, deliberately, you know, hateful or divisive or anti-Semitic, anything of that nature, of course. Um, but I do think it's really important to have that separation to a certain degree, um, but also be constantly assessing on a case by case basis how the art impact, how well I should say the artist impacts the art how the artist impacts the audience and how the art impacts the audience. I think there's a few different relationships at play here. Um, and it's really important to be consistently evaluating those relationships on a more nuanced, continuous level as well. Very well said. Carly, yeah. did you want to chime in? There's a lot of shades of gray to this 
To be sure. And there's so many different factors, maybe the historical value, like Casey, like you said, there's not going to be another ring cycle. Wagner wrote that and we can't pretend like it didn't happen, like it's not significant in, in the literature. Um, and, and like Alana, like you were saying, like your personal connection with the art plays a role in whether you're willing to just say like, nope, I don't condone this person's actions or what they've said. And so I don't relate to this art anymore. Of course, you can't you can't just turn it off like that sometimes. Um, you know, Ksenia, before I heard what you said about kind of redemption and, and rehabilitation and that sort of thing, forgiveness and moving on, um, I was totally prepared to say that, you know, yeah, like if I, if I can support, say, another composer rather than one that has said things that's discriminatory or offensive, then yes, I want to do that. And, and beyond beyond supporting somebody financially by buying their music or programming or, you know, performing their music. Um, if beyond, beyond just supporting them or, or not like we all, like those of us that have a platform say, if I'm, if I'm programming music for students to perform and maybe they know about this person's view, am I inherently implicitly like supporting, like, am I saying this is okay, this kind of behavior is okay, we all pretend it doesn't happen, you know, so there's a lot of fine lines and I think a lot of, a lot of shades of gray with, with any of this. Yeah, I think it is also important to make that distinction as well. I think it's possible for two perspectives to simultaneously exist. Like I could say on the one hand, Wagner was a terrible person while also saying that I enjoy Wagner's music. You know, those two things can simultaneously be true. And I think the problem with cancel culture and the, the general mentality surrounding a lot of these issues is that it's a lot easier for people to put these individuals under an umbrella of good or under an umbrella of bad while like you were saying, Carly, so many of these individuals in these situations do operate in a state of gray. And so to lump these people into just these larger classifications of good or bad, um, inclusive or divisive or any sort of extremes spectrum like that, I feel is, is negatively contributing to how we can have this dialogue. I think it is important to continually examine that nuance you know it's perfectly possible for someone who's generally considered to be good to make mistakes or or say something that they regret or to treat someone poorly or and it, conversely it's possible for some someone who is generally regarded as being a bad or hateful person to have an act of kindness or to be considerate. And so it's, it's really important that we acknowledge those states of gray and continue to have more nuanced conversations and how we engage with these people, not just for their art, but also for their humanity. I think we can continue to examine those relationships separately and as one entity as well. I feel like censorship is generally bad, you know, uh, just it's like, OK, you're happy to see things censored when you agree with them. But yeah. well, what about when what about when you don't agree with them? It's like sure. it could very well be the other way. You know, it's like, no, we just, you know, I, I think we should be able to identify who the assholes are. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, if we censor them, we don't know who they are, and then at least yeah. you can stay away from them. And then again, we're not talking about censorship necessarily; we're talking about boycotting, which is different. You know? Yeah, I mean, like going along with what Casey said, I mean, like keep coming back to this example of Wagner, but it's like, you know, like Casey said, like the ring cycle doesn't. You don't sit in the ring cycle and go like, oh, this is just so great. Yeah, Jews are terrible. Like that's not. It's, it's <laughs> an really innocuous piece of work in terms of you know its its message like that. Uh, and it's it's also really difficult in our context because it's it's a historical influential work, and it influenced other composers. So to not need and to the only way it, you know music can exist is if it's performed. I think that's one thing that's so difficult about a performing art. Um, you know we can it's we can't have that anymore if we don't perform it. You know or you know I'm just thinking of like not that uh, Michelangelo did anything, but like. The statue of David, like, what if we found something out terrible about him? Like, would we take the statue of David down? Like, no, like, I don't think we can. <laughs> uh, my, my, 
My, my uh, speaking of just censorship, my colleague, theory professor, my buddy Tim Mainland from Concord University, which was my first job in a teeny, teeny, tiny hilltop town called Athens, West Virginia, which is still so dear to my heart. And anyway, I was there for six years, and he's he's been there for a good thirty plus years. I think he just recently retired, but uh, he he said that the KKK was going to have a march through the town, and this is like a teeny town. Like they probably could have marched the the square and the street they were going to do in fifteen minutes. You know, I mean, it's just very very small. There's one traffic light, and uh, anyway, he said, um, you know, the they let they let them do it. They let them do their march. The police were there to like look around, and a few people pulled up chairs and they walked through, and it was over. <laughs> like that was it. Like nothing happened. They they went away and. It was gone, and I just, I just wonder if, like, if people tried to like cancel it, if people tried to like, just, just, just like whatever, it's stupid. Let them, okay, let them, let them do it. You know, just like, oh, you guys want to do a little stupid march, okay? And and it was just so ineffective, you know. But as soon as there's like the, a huge opposition, I, I feel like, oh, you let making it a bigger deal than it is. Yeah. I, I think that's, uh, I find those examples, especially of groups that literally gather around hate, hatred, um, to be a little bit more difficult to, to handle simply on a, on a level of values, like personal values. But I totally understand that, you know, could we, you know, if we were able to see all different scenarios, okay, we cannot take a magic wand and disband them. They have to exist is the path of, you know, just letting them go through the town. Is that the path during which nobody gets hurt? Yeah, let's do that then. Absolutely. Like figure out they, their psychology and just let them then exist without harming anyone, if that's even possible. I feel like that's an oxymoron with KKK, but, you know, um, I, I just think, yeah, I, I really appreciate everyone's input, but it appears that we've come down to a conclusion that post-mortem, it's easy to separate the art from the artist, but while they're living and making money from their art, it's really hard to um, sort of decide whether we want to engage with them or not. But I think it's really important to not ostracize them, even if they have many controversial attitudes, um, but to sort of try to help rehabilitate them. Um, because that way they will also just not be infected and furious and, and uh, aggressive if they're accepted, if they're not simply, you know, just um, set aside, marginalized in their own way. Um, so for the kind left, you know, for the left that wants to fight for free speech and inclusion, I think we have to find ways to include those and not just sever them like, okay, I have a cut on my finger. It's a faulty finger, bye finger, you know, um, sort of not, not do that. Don't amputate the bad members of society, include them and heal them if possible. Mm, yeah, that's, I like that. That's cool. That's it. Thanks for coming to my chat talk. <laughs> we all need a little bit more unity, especially I think in the US like we, right now. I feel like we censor, you censor groups so much of their position is like, hey, people are trying to censor us, and you know, yeah. the government's trying to censor us. So when they try to do their little thing, and then there's like protests and huge big to do, it's like, see, see, they're trying to they're trying to silence us. Like, no, we let you do your stupid little thing, and you walked through, and two people saw you. And it was totally meaningless. Like you have no supporters. Like like they, they had no supporters in this town. You know, it was just them. That was it. Yeah. But I think Did it they never have, come back. Uh, no, I never heard about it again. No, or at least my my colleague. I mean, I wasn't. I wasn't. I possibly wasn't alive during this time. But. Uh, <laughs> good. Well, moving on, Alana, I have one more question for you before we wrap up. Um, I'm wondering. What does the what does the future of the Tucson Symphony look like for you? What's in the works? Is anything anything coming up that you have to look forward to? Right now, um, we are still going to start our season as scheduled, as far as I know. Um, we haven't received any additional word from our administration about the future of our season, whether that just be this fall or beyond through the rest of the season. Um, but what I am hoping for is regardless of what final decision is reached in that, 
um, that we are still able to continue to curate and release content um, for our patrons, if not in a socially distanced, responsible mask wearing way, um, in a virtual way, um, because I think it is really important to continually be producing content and continuing to try and make music together or the illusion of, of together as much as we can uh, and have that sense of community during this time. Um, and that's been something that I've really cherished about my time with the Tucson Symphony Orchestra so far is more than I think any other orchestra I've ever had the honor of playing with, there has been such a solid sense of community and the connection that the orchestra has to its community and the level of support and encouragement from our community. Um, and the arts in general are, are really thriving here, even considering that it's a smaller city. Um, so that's something that I'm incredibly happy about and proud of, proud to be a part of. And so I hope that we're able to make the most of that at the very least moving forward through, if not just the fall, through the 2020 to 2021 season. And I'm certainly at least personally going to try and keep myself busy with any projects that I can as well. Well, that's great to hear. It's great to hear. And part of why I ask is I'm just interested in what's everybody doing to make it through this time and to get content out and connect with people when it's it's so challenging. Oh, cocktails. <laughs> what? <laughs> cocktails. <laughs> I'll send you recipes. That's what gets people through. <laughs> Well, on that note, Alana, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been wonderful um, hearing your perspective, and, and thank you for sharing so much with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a blast getting to speak with all of you, and yeah, it was a total pleasure and honor to be here. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alana. Thank yeah. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Carly. Bye. <laughs>